Welcome to Melon Brains. If this is your first time here, please select Visitor using the directional button on the control pad. Then press button A, B, or C. This program makes use of the directional button and the A, B, and C buttons. When you want to go forward to the next topic, the directional button moves the dolphin cursor to Next, then press A, B, or C. To know more about a topic, move the cursor there and press any button. Melon Brain's main program is made up of these seven chapters. Melon Brain's main program is made up of these seven chapters. The main program is controlled with this menu bar. Next takes you to the next item, back to the previous item, and exit leaves the main program and goes back to the main menu. After you've viewed a topic, choose exit to go to the previous selection menu. Press the Start button to bring up the pop-up menu. The pop-up menu contains various functions. If you press the Start button once more, the pop-up menu will disappear.
Now relax and enjoy Melon Brains. Let's take a look at the history of dolphin research. It's said that dolphin research started with the ancient Greeks. Aristotle identified the dolphin as an ocean-dwelling mammal. By the early 1700s, the English naturalist John Ray had dissected dolphins and found them to be intelligent creatures with brains about the size of man's. In 1938, the world's first aquarium opened in Florida, and with it, the start of captive breeding. From the 1950s, there has been research on dead and captive dolphins. There was a shift toward the study of wild dolphins, which broadened to include dolphin healing. Let's meet our researchers. Dr. Ken Norris the leading dolphin researcher. John C. Lilly, researching interspecies communications. Dr. Paul Spong, the orca expert. Dr. Betsy Smith, exploring the power of animal healing. Dr. Denise Hertzing, studying wild dolphins. Dr. Horace Dobbs talks about dolphins and us. Dr. Lyle Watson, the Distinguished Life Scientist. For more information, choose a researcher and press any button. In the early years of, of human dolphin studies, it was often a tendency for us to try to teach the dolphins English. The twist that those studies have taken now are more to either develop a mutual language that's perhaps more of a challenge to, to both of us, to both species, or to look at their language or their communication system and determine is there something we can learn from the way they communicate with each other. the dolphin is in the water. So instead of just using what we call animal-assisted therapy, you are also using aquatic therapy. You have the chance then to bring the two therapies together at the same time. I have a feeling that overtures are being made to us and we're just not responding. We just haven't, haven't got it yet. We do have a, a racial memory of being more aquatic than we are now. And I suspect this lies behind our fascination with aquatic creatures like dolphins. Wow, who are those dolphins? And we began to work with them uh, 
over the years and the pages unfolded slowly and um, we began to learn that we really were working with uh, one of the higher orders of mammals. Well, I wanted to study the brain and the mind, and this is the only way you could get the mind isolated. So the isolation flotation tank was invented in 1954. And I was floating around in the tank one day and wondered what it would be like to float around 24 hours a day, and so I found the dolphins. I was intrigued by the fact that this dolphin that had done this had a brain as big as mine, as complex as mine, and if current evolutionary theory is correct, they've had them for 20 million years longer than us. Now I thought you don't carry a big brain around in your head for 20 million years and not do anything with it. Other, if, you, if you weren't doing anything with it, it would have atrophied. So what was he doing with that big brain of his? I did understand that this was an animal that possessed a huge brain and uh, very little was known about it. Uh, so I was uh, immediately interested in uh, finding out uh, something about this animal and what it used its brain for. Let's look into dolphin physiology. The dolphin family is a, a family of many dozens of species of animals, some of them uh, much smaller than others, and orca is the largest member of the family. Uh, dolphins inhabit every ocean of the world. Uh, they exist in some part in, in really huge numbers. Uh, dolphin families can have literally thousands, or at least dolphin groups, communities, uh, not really sure of the correct social term, uh, can exist in, in many thousands of individual animals. Here you can find out about the different dolphins and their environments. Make your selection, then press any button.
Dolphins and whales are members of the same order of mammals, the cetaceans. Their bodies have evolved in various ways to help them live better underwater. For instance, their streamlined shape, which makes them better swimmers, or their nose, which evolved into the blowhole located on the top of the head. The bottlenose dolphin can swim at up to 25 miles per hour and dive down beyond 2,000 feet. Light doesn't travel well underwater, but sound can travel very far. So dolphins have much better hearing than vision. Touch is also important. When dolphins touch, they are communicating. And although they have a good sense of taste, they don't use their sense of smell very often. Opinion varies, but Dr. Norris says that dolphins sleep in close groups with their echolocation inactive and one eye kept open, the one facing the other dolphins. There is always one dolphin on guard duty to watch out for predators. The one eye open lets them keep track of their relative positions in the group. With the outfacing eye closed, they sleep about four hours. Then they regroup, close the other eye, and sleep for another four hours. Dolphins kept in aquariums have been seen to float on the surface when sleeping. Dolphins have been seen to dive very deep in search of food. The bottlenose can dive to more than 1,600 feet and the long-finned pilot whale to more than 2,000 feet. Just how fast can dolphins swim? Most dolphins can swim up to 25 miles per hour, which is very fast. But the fastest of all is the orca, which can swim at an amazing 40 miles per hour. Um, well, dolphins have brains uh, anatomically um, as, as, as large as ours and as, as complex as ours. We think that our higher levels of, of mental processing of data and the intellectual processes associated with the appreciation of music, etc., are, are associated with the cerebral cortex, the upper layer of the brain. The bigger the surface area, the more cells you can get there. And that is one of the parameters that we associate with high intelligence and high intellect. And the dolphins are even more, their brains are more fissured than ours. And therefore able to accommodate more cells. And therefore on that anatomical basis, we would say that they have a capability for intelligence equivalent to that of human beings. Make your selection, then press any button. If we compare brain weights, whales have the heaviest brains, followed by elephants, dolphins, humans, and chimpanzees. If we compare brain to body weight ratios, humans have the highest ratio, followed by dolphins, elephants, chimpanzees, and whales.
if we compare brain weights with So I think being in the water stimulated all those things and probably developed um, brain complexity in cetaceans as it has in us. In the same way, it seems to me that the, the brain, the big brains of dolphins came about entirely because of their retreat to the sea or their aquatic move. They left land as a fairly simple, uh, brainy in the sense that a, a, a dog or a weasel is, but not bright in the way a dolphin is. So something must have pushed them into that, and I think it was being in the water that did it. Uh, it seems the evolutionary line runs from the land to a riverine situation and from there into the marine environment. Much has still to be discovered about the dolphin's evolution, but the ancestor of the modern dolphin is thought to date back about 20 million years. Let's find out what a dolphin's brain is really capable of. Dolphins have memories which uh, seem as good as ours. Um, we have to split uh, uh, phone numbers up into three digits at the first and four at the end because our memories begin to fail when we get seven uh, uh, unrelated things like numbers lined up. So we put a little dash in the middle and our phone number comes out 456-2307 uh, or whatever. The dolphin seems able to remember one more than we can. Dolphins are also great mimics. When they hear the cries of another animal, they will immediately try to copy the sound. Here dolphins are looking for food. So how do they catch food in the shadowy depths? We can't see it, but dolphins use sound waves to locate and identify underwater. They can see size, shape, weight, even internal organs with an accuracy far greater than our radar. This is called echolocation. The melembrane is unique to dolphins and is what makes echolocation possible. The melon is found in the dolphin's forehead and is separate from the brain. It is made of a special fatty tissue. The melon acts as a kind of radar dish, capturing and sending sound waves. Well, they use their sounds underwater to communicate. They also have sonar and can describe objects by means of sound, especially in the dark and at long distances and in muddy water. They use frequencies, you know, very, very high, 30 kilohertz. Their sonar is about 150 kilohertz. Since that time, we found that dolphins do in fact put out a beam of sound, and they put it out of their forehead. It comes out just like the light on a railroad train's headlamp that goes back and forth. And uh, they in fact uh, hear sounds mostly through their jaws. Through the rear end of their jaws, they pick the sounds up. There's even some good evidence that if they open their mouths, they can actually hear them through the inside of their mouths, back in the corner of the jaw, and then this goes to either ear, depending on which side the sound hits. To produce sound, a valve below the blowhole is agitated by air expelled from the lungs. This dolphin seems to be searching for food. Let's watch for a while.
echolocation is not just used for finding food. By sending a powerful sound burst at its prey, the dolphin can disorient the prey and make an easy kill. Let's take a look at dolphin communication. One, two, three, four. Dolphins learning One, English. Two, three, four, five. John C. One, Lilly started two, the Janus three, Project four. in 1955. His aim was to learn the intelligence of dolphins and, if possible, teach them English or even learn the dolphins' language. Well, in the Virgin Islands, I had a dolphin pool and an isolation tank, and Margaret Howe uh, was teaching Peter Dolphin uh, English syllables, and he learned them pretty well. And then from that point, we went to uh, Coconut Grove, where we were teaching Elvar the same sort of things. And then we went from there to California and taught uh, Joe and Rosie by means of a computer. Now a computer can use the higher frequencies. Dolphins speak at 10 times our frequency and 10 times as fast. So that the program Janus was founded in order to take advantage of that. Research in aquarium tanks went on until 1964. From the 1970s, research shifted to the study of dolphins in the wild. One result of this was new information on the different ways dolphins communicate, information on the voice, on gesture, and on touch. The jump was found to be a way of communicating location, the crash of re-entry leaving bubbles for others to echolocate. Here are some young dolphins at play. Touch plays a very important part in communication among dolphins. Rubbing is an expression of intimacy. Head to head is used to show anger and aggression. as is open mouth confrontation or raking. Let's look more closely at vocal communications. When a dolphin sees someone it wants to talk to, it calls its name. The system is similar to telephone calling. Inside of a school, if one animal mimics the other, that phone line is open. Of course, everybody can listen in. It's a, it's a party line. But uh, that's the way much of the school is organized. Here are three forms of communication used by Atlantic spotted dolphins. Please select an example. Make your selection, then press any button. We also use uh, burst pulse sounds, which are another kind of social sound. And this is an example of a burst pulse sound. Um, this is, happens to be a synchronized squawk. This is a group of males that are chasing, male spotted that are chasing a bottlenose dolphin who happens to be an, an intruder in this case. And so they're coordinating their behavior, they're synchronizing their swimming, but they're also synchronizing their vocalizations. And it's a very powerful sound. As you can see, it's very white and bright, so it's very intense.
Dolphins communicate in a lot of different modalities. And the one we've focused on over the years has been acoustic, so we've looked at their sounds. And what we've done over the years is to try to track individuals, uh, put their sounds on computer. Um, for example, here, there we'll see some uh, signature whistles of an individual we call white patches. She's a young adult female that we've known. And they appear to use them both to express who they are. For example, a mother might make her signature whistle and then her offspring recognizes that whistle and will reunite with the mother. Or in some cases, it might be another dolphin using that mother's signature whistle to initiate contact with her. So in essence, it, it possibly functions as a name. Dolphins are also known to have things like distress whistles. Uh, they can also express excitement. Um, we have one vocalization we call an excitement vocalization that is actually like a signature whistle, but it's sort of out of control. And it, the dolphin often does it when it's excited about something or perhaps going into a distressed situation. And the function of that whistle is very clear. A mother or an older dolphin will come over and you know, tend that young animal and actually protect them or calm them down from a situation. So it does definitely express that kind of excitement to other dolphins in the group. Here are some recordings of orca voices. Please select an example. This is two adult orca calling each other. Orca from the same pod communicating. A mother and child calling each other. This is
is Orca Echolocation. Let's take a look at the dolphin community. Most dolphins live in groups ranging in size from a few individuals to several thousand animals. Dolphins are perhaps the most social of all animals. The young, the old, male and female all cooperate together in a kind of mega family. The family protects itself, feeds together and in nurseries, the older animals teach the young. Let me say that the magic of the school is quite real, and it depends on a system within the school in which all the members are a part, and in which they must suppress their individuality or it won't work. That means that in the split seconds during an attack, the animals become ciphers in a super organism, organismal school. They are parts of something larger than themselves. That's the essence of cooperation. They've given themselves over into that cooperative system to a degree that very few other animals on Earth have, I think. Within each pod are groups organized according to age. Let's look at this with the Atlantic Spotted Dolphin. Please choose from these different groups. Make your selection, then press any button. Females, when they get pregnant, which is at least at first around the age of 12 or 13, also they do change their association. For example, uh, three dolphins that we've known for years who grew up together, when one of them got pregnant, she immediately started associating with other older females that were pregnant, probably because they have to forage differently. They have to forage on different fish and perhaps more often uh, for their health. Um, and then once they all had babies, they got together and started associating again. So their reproductive status definitely affects their associations over the years.
Like other long-lived social mammals, they invest a lot in their offspring. They have one offspring at a time, at least for the majority of the time that we know. Um, they may spend three to five years uh, tending that offspring. Uh, the young nurse, for up to that period, up to three to five years, uh, they're certainly weaned and learn how to eat fish during that period of time. The male spotteds are a bit different. They too grow up and change roles, but what happens to them is as they're growing up and getting mature and moving into sexual maturity, they actually form very tight coalitions with each other. This is where they learn how to court females, how to get into a lot of trouble as well. Um, and they form long-term bonds this way. Uh, these bonds may last a lifetime, but they use these bonds to forge together. Uh, to move through different pods. We find the males um, range further and actually uh, move to other pods perhaps to breed and to avoid inbreeding in their natal group. The male spotteds are a bit different. They too grow up and change roles, but what happens to them is as they're growing up and getting mature and moving into sexual maturity, the male spotteds are a bit different. They too grow up and change roles, but what happens to them is as they're growing up and Um, the males and females grow up differently. Uh, they all stay with their mothers till about three when she has another offspring. And then they form uh, juvenile subgroups, often of the same gender. And this is where they learn to interact and um, 
and behave like dolphins do as they get older. They may range anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 miles a day. The area we cover is about uh, 40 square miles. And these ranges can change with age. Sometimes we have dolphins that uh, immigrate to different pods in the area. There's two other uh, pods that we've been following that are sort of south and north of our main study area. Um, the males and females grow up differently. Uh, they all stay with their mothers till about three when she has another offspring. And then they form uh, juvenile subgroups, often of the same gender. And this is where they learn to interact and, um, and behave like dolphins do as they get older. They may range anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 miles a day. The area we cover is about uh, 40 square miles. And these ranges can change with age. Sometimes we have dolphins that uh, immigrate to different pods in the area. There's two other uh, pods that we've been following that are sort of south and north of our main study area. One of the first things that we noticed with the females was that they would reach a certain age, about nine or 10 and they would be moving into the age class and the, and the degree of spotting that we would note as sexually mature. As they're getting to that age, they start taking on roles of babysitting younger dolphins in their group and taking those responsibilities, whereas a few years previous to that, they may have been babysat themselves. Shortly thereafter, in one or two years, they themselves are pregnant and having their own offspring. So in some ways, it's, it's a training for them to become more responsible for learning how to communicate urgency and things to younger members of their society. Make your selection, then press any button. For example, Dr. Norris told us that at one time, one of the two dolphins he was working with fell ill. The other dolphin helped the sick dolphin by pushing it up to the surface and kept it there for a week without eating or sleeping the whole time. For example, Dr. Norris told us that at one time, one of the two dolphins he was working with fell ill. The other dolphin helped the sick dolphin by pushing it up to the surface and kept it there for a week without eating or sleeping the whole time. Within the population, the, the communities are fairly highly structured. Uh, the northern resident community has 16 pods, and pods are uh, very closely related groups of families, uh, basically groups of, of sisters and their children or cousins and their children. And these are uh, groups which will relate to each other 
on a, on a fairly constant basis throughout life. But within those pods, there are nuclear family groups, and we call them matrilineal groups, uh, which consist of basically a mother and her children, and very possibly the mother's mother is also present. And these individuals in these nuclear families, these matrilineal groups, will stay together every day throughout their life. According to Dr. Norris, baby dolphins gather in a kind of playpen at the center of the pod. Mother and child swim together there, and the dolphins learn behaviors in this formation. Let's take a rest.
This is a dolphin photo book. The directional button turns the pages one at a time. A and B buttons make the pages turn automatically. And button C closes the book.